with a little experiment. Try forming a mental image. Perhaps imagine your mother's face. Got it? Now fill it out a bit. Try imagining a, an event that your mother took part in. Something from your memory. Okay. Now I got two questions about that image. The first question is, what kind of thing is it? Is it a physical thing? Is it the electrochemical activity of brain networks? Or is it a non-physical, sheerly mental thing? A fleeting, evanescent thing that can flitter away, fly free of the brain. If you selected option number one, that means you're a mind-brain physicalist. If you selected number two, that means you're a mind-brain dualist. Next question. That image, is it private in the sense that you're the only one that can ever detect it? Is there any way that anyone else could ever see that image the same way that you see it? It turns out those questions are connected in the sense that um, the image is private. It's hard to see how physicalism can be true because then mental images are private things. There are no physical private things. Physical things are public. So in an attempt to defend physicalism, I'm going to argue that something called mind melding is actually possible. And what mind melding involves is one person getting in touch with the conscious states of another person. Now, I should say something about the Vulcan mind meld, because I think people from my generation remember they're from the classic Star Trek. Mr. Spock would often meld his mind with another person that they wanted to know about, and he seemed to find it rather exhausting. And I don't blame him, because apparently the mind meld involved opening up two entire minds to one another. It would be a very confusing and frightening experience. You would experience a weird melange of the other person's thoughts and images with your own. Very puzzling. I'm not going to argue for that. I, I want, want to argue for something much more restricted, where you would simply uh, experience the other person's visual imagery or something like that. Okay, a couple of eth ethical caveats are essential at this point. Because what we're talking about is violating the most sacred privacy that human beings have ever known. The secret workspace that we have and we can scheme in and fantasize in. How different would our lives be if we didn't have that private space? So any experiments involving mind melding should be as non-invasive as possible, ideally not invasive at all, and should be done, of course, with the full consent of anybody involved. Second caveat, um, us physicalists often hear the, the uh, objection of reductionism. This is reductionistic. But reductionism says the mind is nothing. The mind's going to go away. I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm saying the mind is something real, that it's as real as your hand. All right, let me show you some brain pictures here. Uh, so there's the good old functional MRI. This tells us what parts of the brain are working when people do certain tasks. We've learned a great deal from that. A newer technique called DTI allows us to actually see the connections in the brain. We also have our first full-scale theory of how the cortex works. That's the outer wrinkled gray covering of the brain. It's divided up into seven main networks. You can see this slide is a bit of an aesthetic disaster with the colors. But um, now here are three networks that we're going to focus on. That top one is a visual network, which becomes active when you experience conscious vision. So right now, it's active in your brain. Notice a lot of activity toward the back of the brain. The middle one is a network that becomes active when you introspect. So when you imagine that event with your mother, that network was active. It becomes active when we imagine people in scenarios, either remembering ourselves in a scenario or imagining another person in a scenario in order to empathize with them. The bottom network is a really fascinating network. Notice the executive control network. It seems to be the master network in charge of the brain. And notice it's got a lot of frontal activity there. I'm going to argue that that network's f network functions as a sort of self or ego in the brain so that the way, this, the way the networks work is that when we introspect, for instance, that bottom network couples with the introspection network. Then when we switch back to looking at someone visually, it decouples and couples with the top network. So to preface what I'm going to argue is that what we could do to achieve mind melding is connect one person's executive network with another person's visual network so that the first person might say, Wow, did you know that when you look at red, you actually see green, but you've learned to call it red? That might actually be possible. That's called the inverted spectrum problem, an ancient philosophical problem. Okay, so these are the main competitors here. Dualism on the left, physicalism on the right. Dualism is certainly the most popular 
position among the general public. I think if you stopped 100 people on the street that 85 of them would be dualists. Um, physicalism is more popular among philosophers like me. 60, 70 percent of us are physicalists. And of course, scientists are physicalists at a much higher rate. Of course, they're scientists. Dualism, though, has two major objections that even though it's been around since 1630 when it was coined by Rene Descartes, they've not been able to meet. First objection, look at those arrows. So the mind and the brain have to interact, but how do two metaphysically different things interact? If they belong in different metaphysical categories, how do they affect each other, right? I decide to raise my arm, my arm goes up, mental event causes a physical event. How did that happen? Likewise, I smash my thumb with a hammer, I feel pain, a physical event causes a mental event. How does that happen? They've not been able to satisfactorily answer how they interact. Second big ob uh, objection to dualism is that we've never found, using any of our dozen or so imaging techniques, any non-physical mental substance in the brain. Okay, so surprisingly, philosophers, even who are physicalists, often adopt privacy. John Locke from the 1700s said, one man's mind could not pass into another man's body to perceive what appearances were produced. If your friend is staring at something green, these are contemporary philosophers, you cannot look at her and see the greeniness of her experience. Such intimacy is ruled out by the nature of consciousness. It's not just an accidental fact. Consciousness is necessarily not perceptible. The subjectivity of consciousness is an irreducible feature of reality. And now scientists weighing in, but saying the same thing. These are some of the major researchers in this area. The only way I can know about the things in your mind is because you tell me about them. There's no way I can get into your mind to check the redness of your experience. And there's something special about consciousness that cannot be shared under direct observation as the physicist's objects can be shared. Last one. We think consciousness has to be largely private. By private, we mean it's accessible exclusively to the owner of the brain. Okay, so why do all these people believe in privacy? What are their arguments for it? Here's what they're left with, though. If you accept privacy, what amounts is a powerful argument against physicalism for dualism, right? So the logic of this argument is com uh, fine. It's compelling. It's, it's a valid argument. The logic is impeccable, right? So we can't quibble with that. So physicalists are going to have to somehow argue that premise one or premise two is false. Some physicalists have attempted to argue the premise one is false and argue that, in fact, there are physical states that are private, but now it seems like they've created a new metaphysical category. They got two categories, the private and the public. Of course, you can solve the problem if you invent a new category of stuff. The trick is to solve the problem without inventing a new category. So I'm going to argue the premise two is false, that, in fact, mind melding is possible. Okay, so why do they think privacy is, is a fact? Uh, one of their main points is that they might say to me, you're confusing outer perception with inner perception. That is, in the case of outer perception, you can always distinguish between the perceiver and her object, right? But in the case of introspection, they might say, you cannot make this distinction. Somehow, when I say, I am aware of the image of my mother's face, somehow the I and the image of my mother's face are inextricably bound together, cannot be separated in analysis. Again, this seems like a type of dualism to me that we've got a new type of category which involves complexes that are somehow simples that cannot be broken apart. Traditionally, uh, these are three self-skeptics. David Hume from the 1800s pointed out that when I introspect, he said, I don't see any self. I don't see any ego in there. What I see are images and thoughts and feelings and feelings of hot and cold and things like that. And he's right about that, I think. The self, um, the cognitive control network does not appear in consciousness, right? In the 20th century, Ludwig Wittgenstein said that uh, instead of saying, I am in pain, we should simply say there is pain because that would cure us of the temptation to posit a self, an I that feels the pain. But I, I think he's wrong about that. I think I am in pain and there is pain are two different states in the sense that um, it turns out that if you can separate, dissociate yourself from your pain, it gets a lot less aversive if you tell yourself there is pain, but it's not my pain. The pain becomes more bearable. Much more recently, Daniel Dennett has argued that there is no actual self. What there is is a virtual self. There's something we call I, which is the subject of a bunch of stories that we tell people to create an, an, an oppression to society. We tell stories about ourselves. That's all there is. It's a virtual entity. Lastly, the explanatory gap. The argument there is that 
the inner world and the outer world are too different. How could we ever unite the two in an explanation? Right? We know about them by different means, and they just seem so different. But mind melding can help here, because notice it merges the inner world and the outer world, so maybe it can start to fill the gap. Um, so the self, I think, is the executive network. If you look at a list of functions of the executive network that cognitive neuropsychologists might produce, it's the same list that philosophers have been producing for centuries when they, they describe the functions of the ego. Right? It, it's responsible for decision-making and planning, monitoring perception that is correcting perception based on memories. Memories need monitoring. Right? We, most of us know now that when memories pop up, they're not necessarily accurate. Emotions need monitoring, and it's responsible for attention and error correction and things like that. Okay, so what I propose is that we divide and conquer. We do need to separate the conscious state from the self so that we divide the problem into two, and I think each part is soluble. Uh, first, we need to understand consciousness, and next, we need to understand the self, how we relate to the conscious state. Uh, among physicalists, however, there's a fight brewing between two theories, two main competitors, the frontoparietal theory that says that conscious states involve large portions of the cortex in the front and the back. The microconsciousness theory says, no, that conscious states can be relatively small mental states in the back of the brain. But it turns out that the frontoparietal theory, which is the one I'm going to argue against because the microconsciousness theory is much more amenable to mind melding, they were failing to separate the self from the conscious event. They were doing studies on subjects, asking them, push a button when you hear the sound, push a button when you see the color, to uh, research conscious thresholds, right? And so the problem is, if you ask someone to give a response, you're activating the executive network. That was why they saw the activity of that network and confused that network with the conscious state. Once we switch to what are called no report paradigms in which the subject does not give a response, the frontal activity, the executive activity went away. But also we've known since the 1950s when uh, brain stimulation experiments were done in which a tiny electrical current is applied to the surface of the brain. If you do that in the back of the brain, you can actually produce conscious experiences, impressions of color, or you can... Uh, resuscitate full-blown memories if, if you move the probe forward. The front of the brain, if you stimulate the front of the brain, you do not get conscious experiences, which sort of affirms what Hume said. There's no self in consciousness. All right, so here's my plan for mind melding. What we're going to do is merge the executive network with the introspection network called the default mode network. It's called that because, because we tend to sink into it every time we're thinking on our own in the sense that we start to replay memories and plans and things like that. So uh, here's a, an experiment, an actual imaging experiment, in w which the two networks have coupled. So this is intra-coupling. What I'm proposing is interbrain coupling. We allow the executive network of one person's brain to couple with the introspection network of another person's brain. The, the way the networks are connected up makes this fairly feasible in that we, what we would need to do is branch the what are called the association fibers, the white matter, that connect the networks. If we then did that, I would argue that we could actually produce something like mind melding. And then the way is clear for physicalism to complete its theory. Thank you. <laughs>